faced some big challenges this year, uh, 2016, and every year presents new challenges. We had new pests and diseases in the crops, such as uh, eels. Um, people managed to bog tractors, a fantastic series of pictures of bog tractors uh, on Twitter. Great source of inspiration for us all. Uh, but then there was quite a lot of grain uh, produced in the end. The, the thing that we've got to take away is that uh, we've got to learn from those experiences. And experience isn't what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens, what you learn from what happens. And there are some lessons from 2016 that I'll try and translate into what uh, we could think happening in 2017. Some observations about uh, 2016. Nobody knows what the season will be. Nobody knows whether it'll be wet, dry, hot, cold, um, or, ha or whatever. Um, if they do, they certainly wouldn't be uh, working in agriculture. They'd be, uh, they'd be a seer of making some millions of dollars. Forecasting's an art, not a science. They base it on science, but ultimately uh, the scale at which we know uh, what the season's gonna be is limited. 16 was different to 15, 17 is different to 16. Every year will be different and you have to uh, use that information uh, to draw up some general rules about what a nutrition program would look like. And some words that I think of that a good nutrition program are that it should be planned and not reactive, that it should be flexible, it should be nimble, and we've heard that word already today, nimble, and I think that's a really good word to think about, being able to rapidly uh, change your plans. It should be rational, and it should be based on the budget that you have allocated for the nutrients uh, that you're working with. And it should be based on matching source rate, time and place, which is what IPNI refers to as for our nutrient stewardship. How good? is nutrient management. Uh, GRDC supported uh, IPNI to do a survey of farmers. We looked at 500 paddocks in southeastern Australia over five years, same paddocks over five years with their nutrient budgets. And the graph on the left on, in the blue is the partial nutrient balance, that is nutrient removal to nutrient nitrogen use to re nitrogen removal, including nitrogen fixed by legumes for those 500 paddocks over the whole five year rotation, and basically 60% of those paddocks are mining nitrogen. So that goes back to that point that uh, John uh, Kierkegaard made about uh, nitrogen is still something we've got to think about. We're still mining uh, nitrogen. Uh, with if regards to phosphorus, there's still some people mining phosphorus, uh, but in fact, 25% of uh, the paddocks had phosphorus removal uh, that was twice what they were applying. Sorry, uh, phosphorus application was twice what was removed. So phosphorus is still being accumulated in our soil. So there's both those sides. Um, and I think uh, that's a, a good um, message to have about nitrogen being uh, exploited and phosphorus still needs to, is still in a build-up phase. So... 2016, going out the gate, um, we had good yields, higher than average removals. Um, do you know what the actual removals are? Have you done some, any grain testing, for example? Um, here's some uh, examples of, of the normal sorts of values. We would expect that uh, six tonne wheat crop uh, would remove about 18 kilograms of phosphorus. Um, a canola, about 15, three tonne canola crop. If you bale that uh, straw from that crop, you take away another six kilograms of phosphorus. If you burn the stubble, you probably lose about half of that uh, phosphorus in the stubble. Depends a lot on when the rain occurs and to whether the, the uh, phosphorus and the potassium are washed out of the stubble. But the removals are, are high. Um, and law of uh, averages says you get nothing for nothing. And so if you're removing nutrient, you have to either replace it or accept that your soil test value will decline. And a lot of times we've tried to maintain those soil test values uh, with phosphorus, uh, nitrogen. Uh, it's obvious that we're still exploiting organic nitrogen and, and that soil organic reserve uh, needs to be attended to and thought about. 
uh, for, in terms of phosphorus, in, as well as thinking about the removal of that 18 kilograms of phosphorus, uh, we also think that there'll be a soil demand and uh, phosphorus buffering index is a good, a good starting point to think of that. So replacement largely depends on where your soil test sits and um, if you refer to the Better Fertiliser Decisions uh, database, um, we've got some good data on what the current soil test critical values and critical ranges are. Um, Tony Cox has got a stand out there that, that will assist you get, it, get to look at that information. Um, and as well as that, you can, can look at, uh, maybe look at grain removals. Um, grain testing is a nice complement to soil testing in terms of actual removals. We know that uh, phosphorus the content of wheat, for example, uh, ranges from two kilograms to four kilograms per tonne. So where are you in that uh, continuum? Um, one of the things is where you're at a four kilogram uh, phosphorus content, you're going to draw your soil test down much more quickly than if you're at a low soil test trying to build it up, um, simply because of the, the luxury uptake that occurs with phosphorus. So what do we do? We'll take this forward to to 2017, well, we're going to have to be soil testing. Use the right test. Uh, don't ring me up and say, what's a Malik 3 for uh, phosphorus mean? Because I don't know, and nobody really has any data in Australia about that. Uh, use the right test. Use the good labs. Um, and in terms of phosphorus, consider at least balancing phosphorus removal from 2016. Uh, on some of the lighter acid soils, you might look for potassium. Uh, we've certainly been thinking a, a lot about potassium in the last few years. It's not everywhere, but there are, there are places. And one of the key uh, diagnostics is to look for uh, header tracks from last year. Um, and uh, the potassium will leach out of the straw quite quickly or out of the, uh, the um, windrows. And you'll end up with uh, high potassium levels, which is an indicator that the rest of the paddock is low. In the uh, graphic there, we've had... Um, uh, 4.1 in the row is the content of the potassium in, the, in that uh, wheat crop and um, between the rows it was 0.6 and that matched up with some soil test values. So let's have a look at some observations from the field. Um, seven tonne barley crop, very good. Protein, let's say it was 10%, we're budgeting. If we budget, budgeted for that crop, we'd be budgeting about 290 kilograms of nitrogen to feed that crop. And that's about, uh, you know, with an e efficiency of 50%. We look at that, we've had maybe 50 kilograms of, of pre-sowing nitrogen. We've got an in-crop mineralisation of 50 kilograms, which you don't get for nothing, you get that from organic matter. And so the deficit in this case is about 190 that needs to be met with fertiliser. What actually happened with that seven tonne uh, barley crop, it actually went 12.5% protein, which is pretty useless really, but uh, dairy farmers somewhere going to be happy with that. Um, that removal was 160 kilograms of nitrogen and applied in, to that uh, field was um, 120. Let's say the mineral in at seeding was 100. So if you do the grain nutrient use efficiency, we say, wow, look at that. 94% nutrient use efficiency, aren't we fantastic? Uh, but we go back to that question is, how did you get that high nutrient use efficiency? Please explain. Where did that nitrogen come from? Well, guess what? It came from organic carbon. The applied in, in this year, in last year, 2016, was applied with very good efficiency, simply because we got rainfall events um, that were uh, keeping the topsoil moist and so it wasn't, the nitrogen wasn't being um, uh, isolated in the dry topsoil. Um, there may be, that pre sowing may have got uh, 50 kilograms, but the way the, cr the season ran, it probably exploited nitrogen from even deeper in the profile, uh, maybe 70 to 100 uh, centimetres. Um, the grain removal was 160, as we said. The stubble was 70. Uh, there's about 70 kilograms in the stubble, so that means there's about 230 kilograms of nitrogen in our budget of 290, so we're about on the road. And mineralisation, we question is it enough to close that gap and account for the losses? So, let's do our mineralisation quiz. You all look quizzy, ready for it. 
So, where's mineral nitrogen derived from? From what is mineral nitrogen derived is actually the correct uh, form for that. You shouldn't dangle your participle th uh, sentences. Where does it come from? This is the engagement, folks. Thank you. Organic materials, organic nitrogen and fertilisers. And the quantity and quality of those organic materials really de determines what the fate of the nitrogen is. It's a two-way street. You also have, as well as immobilisation, a mineralisation, you have immobilisation. And it, uh, we often express the quality of the materials in C to N ratio, but we should also think about C to N to S to P as well. Just a quick snapshot, if we're thinking about C to N ratios, the C to N ratio of wheat straw essentially ends up being net immobilisation. And um, uh, Jeff Baldock's uh, tool that he uses to look at nitrogen budgets suggests that um, seven kilograms of nitrogen is demanded per tonne of cereal yield. So that's, um, that gives you an idea that, in fact, uh, nitrogen fixation, nitrogen immobilisation, sorry, is something to think about. If it's a pea straw, it's about neutral. If it's a fresh green vetch, it's rapidly available. So if we take that forward, the highest double loads from 2016, um, what we're saying is that there might be another 50 to 70 kilograms of nitrogen in your nitrogen budget that that stubble is demanding. So um, we'll hear more from the stubble initiative about that, but it's certainly something to, to think about. You'll get it back later, but um, you might need it early in the season. Oops. Sorry. So, question two. Whether I can get this thing to move. Um, what's the process, what's the name of the process that forms mineral nitrogen? The first step in the, in the process. It's hard, isn't it? In fact, there are three stages. And it's re worth remembering this three stage, that it is a three stage process. Because the first stage is ammonium uh, being to converted. It's the presence of, or, of organic nitrogen being converted to ammonium. Now, ammonium's the form that's fixed in the soil. It's available to plants, uh, but it really needs to be mineralised. It doesn't leach. It's a good uh, backup uh, form of nitrogen. The second uh, steps, two steps, is the conversion of ammonium to nitrate or called nitrification. So what are the drives, drivers of those processes? What determines whether um, uh, mineralisation is fast or slow? Can you give me three things? Moisture, temperature, and the materials and, and the water content. So, quantity, temperature, and soil water all drive that. So this nitrification process moves ammonium to nitrate, temperatures between 15 and 20. So most of the time, even though we, we might have cold mornings, remember the soil's well insulated. Um, and uh, often for this year, the issue was very much about um, the presence of little oxygen, which, drives the, which stops the process or drives it to denitrification. And uh, nitrification last year, was probably pretty high because we had an early break, we had a warm winter, we had an extended spring, and it could be that if we looked at the normal situation where we have 50 kilograms, we might have had double that amount of mineral nitrogen, which would be enough to explain some of the, the high values. This little graph here is taken from some work uh, by uh, Victor Sadras and Jeff Baldock, look measuring mineralisation across, um, across the year. What we saw, though, this year was a lot of denitrification, and denitrification is where there's free nitrate in the soil. The bugs that are in the soil want oxygen. They can't get it from the air, so they pinch it off the nitrate, and that it leads to gaseous losses as N2, NO, N2O, uh, NO2, and all the various um, uh, compounds uh, of nitrogen. And that occurs where we've got high organic matter, anaerobic soils, which we saw 
high nitrate, which we probably also saw last year, and the soils were reasonably warm. And nitri uh, denitrification can occur, you know, even uh, deeper in the soil than the top 10. Oops, that wasn't good. So what did water logging do? Well, transient water logging, the main effect of transient water logging is in fact reduced nitrogen availability. Um, in essence, it strips the nitrate out of the soil so you go back to, to ground zero um, when, after a water logging event. Um, some nice work that was done in, um, actually in Washington State reported recently was looking at a, an area that was upslope, an area that was downslope, and um, looking where the nitrogen was. And uh, what was seen was that if you looked at the comparison between um, waterlogged uh, yield, uh, yield, for example, uh, the waterlogged yield with added nitrogen benefited from that uh, uh, waterlogging uh, was overcome, somewhat overcome by the addition of extra nitrogen. So the other thing that I sort of took away from last year is that early sown, well-grown crops were better able to survive that waterlogging tolerance. And the other time, the other thing I um, took away was that uh, when you've got a, a field experiment that looks like this, um, your tempted is, temptation is to get the tractors out and go spreading um, or get a plane on I think the moral was that, you know, the mor moral is hurry up and wait. If you put uh, spread your ear on free water, uh, you'll probably lose some as uh, uh, production of ammonia. Uh, if you um, spread it onto waterlogged soils, you'll just exacerbate denitrification. So it's waiting until you can get on the soil. And how, how soon? Well, I think as soon as you can. Um, I used to say that when you walk on, when you could walk on it, but I actually think it might be a little even before that, such as when you can get a, a four-wheel motorbike um, or a tractor, <laughs> maybe not a tractor. So if we take this forward, one of the things we take away from nitrogen is that the paddocks are going to be highly variable in nitrogen this year, nitrogen status. The cupboard's going to be bare, basically, in a lot of those places, depending, you know, it's been denitrified in, in the wetter parts. There's been high removals in the drier parts. So that means we need to really think about soil testing for nitrogen and sulphur, deep sulphur as well. And you consider zones, zoning is a really good uh, strategy for your sampling. The alternative is to think about a nitrogen-rich strip and I seem to, this seems to be almost a mantra over the past few years for me, saying how how useful these are, and quoting Mark Branson, who uses these on his property, he says the strips give him the confidence not to apply nitrogen, not to apply nitrogen uh, when the crop is insufficient. So that in itself is a, a very useful guide uh, in, this, uh, in this system. What do we also see? We also saw a big push for late protein. We had favourable post-anthesis conditions. Everybody got excited. Uh, prices, price differential for um, milling wheat, for feed wheat and uh, H1 were, you know, 45 or 50 dollars a ton. Um, people were keen to go out and top dress nitrogen late in the season. Um, my, the experiences I, I think of is that uh, some were very uh, successful and uh, they were also very lucky uh, with the way the season finished. Because when we think about if you get a protein response from late nitrogen, you've got to think, does the crop actually need more nitrogen? We had a bunch of mineralisation late in the season, which probably helped push nitrogen anyway. Can you actually get more nitrogen into the crop? Is the source that you're using going to be available? Uh, what, in terms of the timing, will that nitrogen go into yield or protein? Early goes to protein, oh, sorry, early goes to yield, late goes to protein. Can you actually get enough into the crop to actually make a difference? Um, can you shift uh, a protein concentration 3%? I don't think so, not with late nitrogen. You might shift it 1%, you might shift it from 8 to 9 or 9 to 10 or maybe 11 to 12, but really you're going to be pushed to uh, push it any further than that. And the finish is critical. 
and that's where the luck com come into it. Um, the important thing I think to remember about protein concentration in grain is it's a function of grain nitrogen and grain starch and those things are independent, independently determined. Uh, the rate of starch deposition depends on photosynthesis and, and conditions uh, relating to growth. The, the protein deposition finishes early and is actually a function of the nitrogen status of the crop at that stage. There's a little bit of nitrogen taken up but generally it's most of the nitrogen in the crop. So if that's the case, why don't we just look at early nitrogen supplies. Um, here's a nice example from um, the high rainfall zone at Hamilton um, where the comparison was between deep banded and top dressed and this is the, uh, this is the crop nitrogen uptake. There was no nitrogen taken up by the crop from 100 kilograms uh, deep banded and in fact nearly all the nitrogen disappeared and was denitrified. So the strategy has to be in those very wet seasons avoiding uh, nitrogen at seeding. Another interesting aspect of the crop um, was something given, uh, shown to me by um, uh, Matt Nile, an agronomist in, the north, in the north central Victoria. He had a paddock that um, had uh, uh, tracks for nitrogen application. Um, around those tracks there was a browned off looking crops and, with, and the crop looked to have small grain in those, in those plots. So what was going on here? Well it could be frost, it could be low copper. Um, copper deficiency occurs when you have high nitrogen supply um, and frost is also sometimes implicated um, when we see small grain, but usually the consequence of, of copper and frost is actually no grain rather than small grain. And so in the, in the picture here, a frosted head doesn't have any grain in it at the top and a copper deficiency, uh, you usually be completely empty. So um, both of those things affect seed number. What, what, when faced with a couple of possibilities, always look for the simplest one and the simplest one here is, is haying off. First, the first thing about it is that the haying off was in areas adjacent to the track and that was the tracks and that was because the spreading pattern was so poor that nearly all the nitrogen was dumped within 10 metres of the spreader width rather than the, the full spreader width. That meant there was excess nitrogen and that led to uh, haying off. The, also, the, it was worse in canola where the high nitrogen status uh, uh, was, which suggested that the canola had a high nitrogen status. Some nice work by Catherine O'Sullivan has uh, identified that in fact canola can act as a, de as a nitrification inhibitor uh, and reserving, preserving nitrogen from the, from the canola crop into the wheat crop and uh, that might be part of the explanation as to why the haying off was worse in the canola even though it received all the, the same nitrogen status. So taking this forward, certainly look for protein but yield's always been king. Balance early and late nitrogen, you've got risk and budget. With low nitrogen status, seeding early might be important. Um, you need about 50 kilograms to get to uh, stem elongation. You can hay off a crop even in a good finish and you've got to take care with fertiliser placement uh, as well, which is something I didn't miss. So in So in summary, where would you put your nitrogen dollars in a normal season, this is a graphic, the graphic uh, uh, on your right is, uh, is about uh, the normal season, maybe a little bit at the seeding, during, more during stem elongation, uh, a bit more after flowering. This year we're liable to be, the cupboard's liable to be bare, so maybe we're looking at more uh, at seeding and maybe uh, less during the season. If you went to a drier environment, I'd be shifting uh, more of that nitrogen investment into the seeding stage and uh, not even considering putting um, nitrogen uh, later in the season. Okay, Craig, I'll, I'll leave it there, but let's say it's not all about nitrogen. Okay.